good afternoon. That's when you reply, good afternoon, to you. <laughs> don't, don't leave me in stunned silence. Um, all right. Um, in just a short while, uh, we'll be joined uh, by the co-chairs of the Global Investors for Sustainable Development Alliance, and that's Leila Foury, the Chief Executive Officer of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, and Jose Vinales, the Group Chairman of Standard Chartered, together uh, with the Assistant uh, Secretary General in the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, Navid Hanif. And they'll be here to brief you on the outcomes of the annual meeting of the um, Global Investors for Sustainable Alliance meeting, uh, which took place uh, this morning in presence of the Secretary General. Um, the Secretary General this morning also spoke to the Fifth Committee, which, as you know well, handles the UN budget, and he presented his proposed budget uh, for 2023. He told member states that our reform continues to help us deliver better. We are shifting our center of gravity from headquarters to the field, he said, adding that we are speeding up our decision-making processes and moving, it closer to, moving them closer to the point of delivery. We have made a significant progress in strengthening our internal controls, he said. The Secretary General said that reform of the development pillar also continues to yield results. More than nine out of ten governments expressed appreciation for the COVID-19 response from the UN development system, from health to humanitarian assistance to socioeconomic reports, and we've been briefing you on those uh, activities regularly. Uh, to fully implement our mandate, he told member states we will require 3.22 billion U.S. dollars. The proposed budget includes continued investments in development, a strengthening of UN counterterrorism work, the strengthening of human rights and humanitarian affairs and strategic action to address racism in the Secretariat, adding that we are on a positive trajectory towards achieving gender parity in the UN system. We achieved gender parity among senior leadership for the first time in UN history and did so two years ahead of schedule. His remarks were shared with you. And staying on the issue of uh, budget, we have a new contributor to the regular, to the regular uh, budget, which is now stands at 132 member states. And that uh, country is, has Africa's largest deposits of bauxite any idea what country that is? Guinea. So we thank our friends in Conakry for being the 132nd member state to pay up its dues in full. Um, at a Security Council open debate on climate and security in Africa, Martha Poby, the Assistant Secretary General for Africa, said that to support the continent in addressing the impact of climate change on peace and security, we must act on multiple fronts. She said that ambitious climate action and to accelerate the impl uh, implement, we need ambitious climate action and also accelerate the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Ms. Poby highlighted three additional priorities for action. First, she said we need to increase our capacity for risk analysis and integrated climate lens into conflict prevention, peacemaking, and peace building. Second, our efforts to deliver peace and security must place people at the center. And third, we must seize opportunities for climate action peace, and peace building to reinforce each other. Her remarks were shared with you. Uh, turning to South Sudan, uh, engineers serving with the UN peacekeeping force in that country report they have successfully repaired breaches in a dike caused by severe flooding in Benchu in Unity State. Uh, the dike was constructed last year by UNMIS and the International Organization for Migration to help protect more than 100,000 displaced families, as well as to get access to the airport following the worst floods in 60 years. Water is now being pumped out of flooded uh, parts of the camp, and in the mission is repairing roads north of Bentu to help secure the trade route, as access to a town is limited because of the flooding. Uh, moving on to this hemisphere, three quarters of refugees and migrants from Venezuela are struggling to access basic services in Latin America and the Caribbean. That's according to a new study co-led by the UN Refugee Agency and the International Organization for Migration. The study says that four, some 4.3 million refugees and migrants from Venezuela face challenges accessing food, housing, and stable employment. Half of all refugees and migrants in the region cannot afford three meals a day and lack of access to safe housing. 
To access food or avoid living in the streets, many Venezuelans resort to survival, sex, begging, or indebtedness. The agencies call for the enhanced protection and access to services and employment opportunities. Full study is online. Also, um, uh, I can tell you that in Central America, uh, following Hurricane Julia, our humanitarian colleagues there are in their various country teams are engaging with authorities in impacted countries and stand ready to, f to provide assistance, further assistance. The entire region, as you know, has experienced torrential rains, which triggered floods and landslides uh, in Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. Uh, which have all evacuated, uh, where many, up to 20,000 people have evacuated to temporary shelters. And in Cuba, uh, following the impact of Hurricane Ian, uh, the UN team there launched a $42 million plan of action to support authorities to address the needs of people impacted by the hurricane. The plan is expected to benefit almost 800,000 people and includes $3.7 million to repurpose from the UN's team's funding as well as additional $7.8 million from the Central Emergency Fund from the United Nations. The plan supports both the immediate uh, response efforts as well as long-term recovery needs in highlight, highly impacted sectors such as housing, health, education, food security, and access to drinking water and electricity. And tomorrow we will be joined by Matthias Schmale, the resident and humanitarian coordinator at Interim in Nigeria. Uh, he will brief us and you on the situation in Nigeria. Betul. Thank you, Steph. A question on Lebanon. Lebanese officials said that they will... Uh, question on Lebanon? Uh, Lebanese officials said that they will start sending the Syrian refugees back to Syria at the end of next week. What is your reaction? And has well, the UN or any UN official talked to any Lebanese authorities? I think uh, in terms of what contacts may be had, I would encourage you to talk to our UNHCR colleagues. What I can tell you is that our, our principal position remains that no one should be forced uh, to return. All returns should be voluntary and done in dignity. And also, we need to ensure that where people are going returning to is safe. Um, and we also, at the same time, need to recognize uh, Lebanon's uh, extreme generosity uh, towards Syrian refugees since the start of the conflict there. Would you say that Syria is safe enough for the Syrian I, refugees I think to that's go back? A, that's a decision, uh, that's a comment UNHCR would make. Also, I think it would depend where. And does the SG think that, is it the right time for Lebanon well, to a, a, send them again, back? Again, it's not whether it's the right time or the wrong time. It, it's They are uh, procedures to be respected when these things happen. Edie. Uh, thank you, Steph. Um, on the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, the electricity went out, it went back on. Um, the IAEA chief, Mr. Grossi, has said that this is basically untenable. Is the Secretary General involved in any way in uh, trying to achieve this uh, security zone outside the plant? Well, I mean, uh, those discussions continue. They've also been very much uh, led by, uh, by Mr. Grossi. I mean, what, but let's be honest, what we've seen uh, since that Secretary General and others talked about the security zone is, in fact, we're going the wrong way. Correct, right? I mean, we're seeing more fighting and more fighting around there, uh, which uh, we can only echo Mr. Grossi's concern as he would know better than most what the risks are. Deji. Oh, sorry, did you have enough follow up? Yeah, yeah go I ahead. A, I, well, I had a question on another topic on, on Haiti. Um, the Secretary General's letter made. Um, a very serious appeal for international action uh, to try and uh, basically get humanitarian aid in and end gang war warfare. Um, what kind of a response has he received to the letter? Well, it was a serious appeal because it's a serious situation. Uh, the, the, the blockage of the fuel depot at uh, Varreux continues to be, uh, to hamper 
our ability and the government's ability uh, to deal with the humanitarian crisis. Our understanding is that there are a number of discussions going on in various capitals and also we hope contacts with the Haitian governments. But what the Secretary General is proposing was for bilateral support uh, from member states, from those member states who have the capacity to do so uh, to the Haitian authorities. Is the Secretary General satisfied with the uh, degree of um, what should I say, interest or um, outreach from countries to Haiti? We, we know discussions are going on. I think these are serious decisions to be taken by member states, uh, but we hope they will be taken uh, quickly because the Haitian people need help quickly. Deji, and then... First, I have a follow-up with the Haiti question. Um, we know that yesterday, uh, Mr. Grassi of IAEA met with the uh, Russian President Putin. And I presume in the past 24 hours, the Secretary General has not contacted any high-ranking officials in Russia. So has the Secretary General talked to Mr. Grassi about their, their meetings? Uh, I don't think the Secretary General spoke directly to Mr. Grossi. I know the, our colleagues in the um, uh, Office for Disarmament are in constant touch with him, and Mr. Grossi and his uh, team keep them uh, uh, briefed, and they in turn brief the Secretary General. And the second question, it's been quite a time. I, I feel obliged to ask, is there any development on the fact-finding mission of Olenivka? No. Okay. Not for lack of trying on our part. Kirsten, and then we'll come back here. Thanks. On Haiti, <clears throat> um, after uh, the UN acknowledged that uh, peacekeepers brought <clears throat> cholera there um, after the earthquake, um, there was a big effort to improve the water and sanitation systems there, um, fundraising appeals and so on. Some organizations are criticizing the UN now for not following through on that. Do you have an update on where things stand um, with UN efforts to f fix the sanit water sanitation system there? And, and I, is, is, you know, how do you respond to that, that the UN didn't follow up on I mean, that we've, I, I, I would, uh, I'm not going to relitigate uh, the origins, uh, and no one is uh, is questioning. Uh, I'm not going to go back there. What I can tell you is that since then, especially in the last few years, the UN has been actively engaged uh, in support of the Haitian authorities with the international community to do its best to eradicate cholera from Haiti and also support uh, local communities that have been uh, impacted. Um, we have raised money. Uh, we have created surveillance networks, which is one of the reasons that this latest case was actually, uh, uh, was actually uh, picked up. Um, so I, I think um, we have been uh, extremely diligent um, in following through in what we said we were going to do uh, in order to help uh, help Haiti and the Haitian people uh, in dealing with uh, water and sanitation. The overall situation, the humanitarian situation, the, the security situation has made all of that very challenging. But we were very close uh, to having three years without a cholera case until this latest breakdown uh, happened in the midst of a complete security breakdown where health workers uh, were not able or had great difficulties reaching those who needed help the most. Madam. Thank you so much. You mentioned the uh, contribution of more than 130 countries to the UN budget. I wonder whether Ukraine has already paid its due. And uh, uh, is it true that uh, Russia pays only like 2% of uh, UN budget every year? Some? No, I mean, the, the, the scale of assessment for each member state is a public document. And uh, I don't have the, I don't have the, the slice that every member state pays off the top of my head, but that's a public document that you, you can uh, look at. Uh, we will check our uh, records. I, I also don't have the list of all 132, but someone will check before the end of this briefing, and I will let you know. Thank you. Iptisam. 
Thank you, Steph. Um, a French Palestinian human rights lawyer has been detained in uh, Israel. Uh, his name is Salah uh, Hamouri. A sorry, say, say, sorry, say again. Then. Okay. So a French Palestinian human rights lawyer uh -huh. uh, has been detained by Israelis uh, for six months. Uh, his name is uh, Salah Hamouri. He has been detained in so-called um, uh, administrative um, detention or prison for uh, charges. He doesn't even know exactly what they are. He's, um, 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 he got uh, on hunger strike two weeks ago. Uh, and in, uh, in July, according to press reports, he wrote to the French president, because he's also a French uh, citizen, uh, to ask uh, for um, help in his case, and then he was also, after that, transferred to a maximum security prison. Um, are you familiar with his case? Uh, do you have any comments on... Uh, he's not the only one. Right. As you know, there's a lot of Palestinians who are in um, so-called uh, administrative detention. Uh, I mean, I, uh, I personally am not familiar with this case, but I will look, and I'm sure our, uh, some of our colleagues are, and I'll try to get you some updates. We have expressed and will continue to express our, our, our deep concern about the continued use of administrative detentions. Um, yes. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, does the Secretary General have any comment on the maritime uh, boundary agreement between Lebanon and Israel that was announced today? Uh, Yes, and I can tell you that we welcome uh, the announcement uh, that we saw by the White House uh, today that the government of governments of Israel and Lebanon have agreed to formally end their maritime boundary dispute and establish a permanent maritime boundary between them. Uh, it's clear I, you know, the, this kind this agreement will uh, clearly uh, benefit the the stability uh, and the prosperity uh, of the region. I mean, I think it's a, it's a positive development. We remain closely engaged with the parties and stand ready to continue to support this process as requested and in close co coordination with the U.S., uh, which has been entrusted as the mediator uh, by both Israel and Palestine, and, um, and Lebanon, excuse me. Yes, Miriam, and then we'll come back to the front. Thanks, Steph. Um, Iran Human Rights Organization announced today that Two um, hundred and one people were killed during protests in Iran, including twenty um, three children and these numbers do not include the um, Sanandaj protest, which was um, uh, there was a huge crackdown by security forces. Um, do you have these reports and do you have any new message from the Secretary General or any new um, talks between Secretary General and um, Iranian official, uh, officials. Well, on the specific issue of children, uh, I can tell you that uh, violence against children, uh, killing of children, any sort of violence against children is completely unacceptable and unexplainable. And I think Catherine Russell, the head of UNICEF, was very clear in what she said about that uh, yesterday or two days ago. From our standpoint, we, we continue to follow this situation uh, very closely. We continue to be remain uh, concerned about the reports of fatalities, including women and children, uh, and as related to the large-scale uh, protest. We're also very concerned about the reports that we're seeing of excessive use of force, um, and it's important that the security forces refrain from using disproportionate force to avoid any further casualties. It's also important that the authorities listen to the legitimate grievances of the population, especially and including in respect to the rights of women. We take note uh, that we've, we've seen reports uh, that the authorities said they would uh, are willing to engage and, in, and hold dialogue with the protesters. We encourage all good faith efforts to that end and we reiterate our call to respect human rights, including the right to freedom of expression, the right to peaceful assembly, and the right to freedom of association, and also underline the need for accountability. Uh, on Ukraine, they have paid, and they paid their full their dues in uh, full in uh, on January 10th of $1,608,696, to be precise. Um, and given that they've paid in the first uh, month, 
it's included, those countries who pay in the first month are included in what we call the honor roll. Uh, Steph, tomorrow, Turkish President Erdogan is meeting President Putin in Astana, Kazakhstan, and I'm just wondering if the SG has any, has had any contacts with the Turkish President ahead of this meeting, and if he did, what what is his message to President Putin through the Turkish President? Uh, he has, Secretary General has not spoken directly uh, to President Erdogan uh, in the last uh, week or so. Uh, we continue to be in very intense contacts with uh, the Turkish authorities as part of uh, the Black Sea Grain Initiative and the role uh, that Turkey has, has played. Um, we hope that that meeting will contribute uh, to the Secretary General's aim on the practical end, which is obviously the expansion, the extension of the Black Sea Grain Initiative, the increasing facilitation of, uh, of Russian fertilizer and trade, and will contribute to um, moving us in the right direction. Has there been any update or any positive development in the extension and expansion no, announcement? Nothing you made? that I can share with you at this time, and we have something to share with We will. Okay, I will. Oh, Abdel Hamid, sorry, and then we'll go get to our guest. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, today, the West Bank went, to, went into a strike in, in support of the Shafat refugee camp who has been under siege for the last five days. Um, the violence in the West Bank is going out of hand. Israeli are waging a genocidal war against the Palestinians. The settlers also attacking people who are uh, picking the olive uh, trees. And in Hebron, a few settlers burned copies of the Quran and they threw it at the Palestinians. And yet, with all these developments, we don't hear anything from Mr. Winsland or from No, I, 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 disagree, I disagree with you, Abdel Hamid. You heard from Mr. Venisland uh, uh, just uh, I, two, you heard from him just two days ago. Uh, I, I he not he two days uh, ago, I, and I think I would re, I would encourage you to read his latest statement, uh, which which I the did. which the latest um, developments on the ground, I think, make all that much more relevant. Um, I, I did his tweet. I did read his tweet. Okay. Uh, uh, I mean, there was a it was a it was a statement. I mean, you you and I will will yeah. not agree on this. Uh, that being said, we will continue, and I will go get uh, our guests. Thank you.